Good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, National Science Week, and we're here today for a fantastic couple of hours of focusing in on two of our most uh, beautiful bird species that we find here in the southeast, the glossy black cockatoo and the gang gang. Uh, my name's Doug Record. I'm your Zoom host for today. And the good news is that I'll disappear shortly and I just sit in the background and you'll get to hear from some really interesting and wonderful people. Um, I'd just like to start off proceedings by showing my respect uh, and acknowledging the traditional custodians. Uh, I'm based here at Bournder National Park at the Bournder Environmental Education Centre. Um, and uh, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians, the Dirigang people of the Yuan Nation and uh, to extend those acknowledgements to any Aboriginal persons present. Uh, just in terms of some basic housekeeping stuff, We've got um, chat available for you. If you've got a question, um, you can put it in chat. And there is also, you should have access to a Q&A button on your presentation where you can also put questions. Um, probably housekeeping stuff, if there's something that you, you need addressed, you can put in the chat and Q&A for the questions. But either, either way, we'll get to them. Uh, because I'm experimenting, I um, uh, was going to put up a poll uh, just for you to have a quick look at. I saw a glossy black cockatoo in the past 55 minutes, in the past 24 hours, in the past week, in the past month, in the past year. So the most recent sighting is what we're after. Let's just have a quick look and see if anyone's had the good fortune of seeing one. I, I mean, you could um, refer to a sighting on iNaturalist if you did see one in the past five minutes and then we know you were genuine. Um, but I'm going to uh, try and share the results and this is where my limitations <laughs> will come through. Um, we've got um, two people, 10% have seen one in the past 24 hours uh, and 35% uh, of the participants have seen um, one in the past year. So we get them here at Bournder. I was going to be sitting outside because sometimes they're in the black butts here and they rain down the uh, nuts of the black butts that, as they've been sitting up there eating the fruit and uh, it's too windy out there, so I'm indoors. So look, our moderator for today is Mike Jefferis. Um, I'm going to hand over to you, Mike, and you can introduce our speakers for our first session. Uh, thanks, Doug. I'm Mike Jeffress. I'm a member of the committee of Butterwang Coast Atlas of Life, also a member of BirdLife Shoalhaven. And I'm particularly happy to introduce the speakers on the Glossies in the Mist project because I do love Glossies. We used to see them around here in Ulladulla quite often, a few times a year three of them, usually three, always three. Since the fires, we've seen them almost every day. Uh, and the biggest number I've seen in one go is was 28. So what are some of the, one of the things I would like, like to know about Glossies in the Mist, I just love the name Glossies in the Mist and I'd like to know where that came from. So I'll introduce the speakers. Uh, Lauren Hook is an ecologist. <coughs> and a Saving Our Species and Threatened Species Officer working with the New South Wales Department of Planning, Industry and the Environment. Lauren manages a suite of diverse threatened flora and fauna projects in the Illawarra and Southern Highlands. Erna is a member of BirdLife Southern Highlands and a volunteer with the Glossies in the Mist Project and she's a passionate believer in the value of citizen science. So Lauren, I think is going first. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. Um, just waiting for our slides to come up. Oh, there we go. Awesome. I'll just answer your question quickly about the the name, Doug. Um, our team Mike. was sorry, Mike. Sorry. Um, our team was sitting in the pizza shop in Robinson called Pizzas in the Mist and was dreaming up this project. And so it sort of ended up being glossies in the mist, also because there's lots of mist up in the Southern Highlands. So yeah, um, good day everyone. My name is Lauren Hook. I'm the Threatened Species Officer working on the Glossies in the Mist project. And I'll be talking to you today about how to identify a glossy black cockatoo 
the outcomes of our project so far, and then I'll be handing you over to one of our amazing volunteers, Anna Lenore, to talk to you about the community-led photo identification project. Firstly, I'd just like to acknowledge that our work has been undertaken on Gundungo country up in the Southern Highlands. All right, so glossies in a nutshell. They're vulnerable in New South Wales and endangered federally. Um, they're the smallest of our five black uh, cockatoos in Australia. And in our area and on the south coast of Eastern New South Wales, they're the only one with a red tail. So it makes them pretty easy to identify. Um, they eat only species of she oak, different species of she oak. So in our area, they eat um, Alicajarina littoralis, which is black she oak, and also Viticillata, which is the drooping she oak. Um, and they have a really cool modified bill so they can hold the, the she oak cones and they, they rip it open and then they get at the little nuts. And that's what you can see underneath the, the foraging feed trees that they have been feeding in. Um, another thing is that they bond for life. So around two, they'll mate up and then they'll stay with that partner for the rest of their, their lives. And the longest um, recorded Wild Glossy was 34. She was a banded glossy down in Kangaroo Island, but we reckon they probably live for a lot longer than that. That's just what we know about. Um, they raise one chick a year and they need a really deep, large hollow, um, an upright hollow as well. So they're a bit specific with their hollows and their feed, um, which makes them vulnerable. Um, and like most other birds, oh, that's their flight call as well. <laughs> Thanks, Anna. Um, unlike most other birds, the female glossy is the most colourful of the pair and they have patches of yellow plumage on their heads um, that are individual. So you can see that that glossy in the middle there, she's the female and you can see her juvenile up the branch from her as well. The younger birds have more banding in their tails. So you can see that juvenile has a light colour in its tail and also lots more banding than the male that's further down the, the branch that has almost no banding in the tail. And the females usually have a bit more orange and yellow in their tails and the males generally don't have, they just have red. So yeah, <laughs> I'm flying away again. <laughs> so the Glossies in the Mist project is a Saving Our Species project and it's a landscape um, program working across the Southern Highlands. Um, it focuses on the Great Western Wildlife Corridor, which you can see in the map there with the, the nice yellow arrow going through it. So it's a vegetative corridor that links up the Blue Mountains Wilderness Area in the north to the to Morton Wilderness Area in the south. And it runs through the western side of Winter Caribbean Shire, a little bit into Goulburn at the bottom. And it's got a whole lot of different people living on that land. So it's a lot of private land. There's some state forests, there's some national parks, there's a lot of council reserves as well. But it's pretty much why we needed a big community engagement project to really get that community to understand, you know, what glossy feeding habitat looks like and how to protect it. Um, so we started off by training the community on how to recognize glossies and um, the chewings under the trees as well. And suddenly everyone started reporting them. Before the project, there was about 20 sightings recorded in Bionet. And now we have over 800 sightings of glossies. And so that's not just individual birds, that's just sightings of them. And over 100, oh no, sorry, over a thousand feed trees as well recorded and protected in Bionet. Um, the project also has an amazing photo identification project in it as well, which catalogues um, individual females by their facial colour. And so far we've got 180 individual females um, identified and Erna's gonna tell you all about that in a sec as well. Um, also throughout the corridor, our team goes and surveys 127 sites to identify if there's significant foraging habitat there so that we can map it and protect it. And out of all of these sites, just over half of them have, a, have active feed trees in them. So it shows that the glossies are actually accessing um, foraging habitat throughout the whole section of the corridor. Um, and it also allows us to work out if there's areas that need revegetation or protection. Um, and it allows us to track their activity over time as well. So we have surveyed this area before the fires and after the fires. And quite interestingly, it's been used about the same across the um, across the corridor, but more significantly in the southern area, there's been a lot of feeding down there, which is just adjacent to the to the Morton Burn. Um, after the fires as well, because the fires did affect the Morton area at the, at the south and the 
Blue Mountains Wilderness Area at the north, but the main section of the corridor was not burnt. And so that actually is now acting as this big um, refuge for not only glossies, but a whole lot of other fauna as well. And so we decided we'd uh, undertake a nest box trial because there has been successful nest box programs in other areas, but we just didn't know if our glossies were gonna use them and if there was threats associated with us putting nest boxes up. So we really wanted to um, have a scientific um, trial where we monitored the nest boxes. And so we use motion sensor cameras above the nest, nest boxes to see what's using them and see what interactions are happening there. Um, and they've been up for just over a year now. So they're halfway through their second breeding season. Um, and we haven't had glossies in them yet. We've had glossies around the boxes and feeding in trees near them, but we haven't had them nesting in them. Um, there's been quite a few possums breeding in them and a couple of other birds as well. But um, we're just sort of monitoring for the next stage of if we are gonna do some adaptive management with them. Um, another really big part of the Glossies in the Mist project is planting trees. And so to date, we've planted almost 20,000 trees to enhance foraging habitat, and nesting habitat of glossies across the corridor. Um, and we've undertaken two mass plantings in a highly fragmented area. And we've also secured funding for a further 10 over this year. So hopefully COVID permitting, we will be able to get in there and make some really good connections within the fragmented parts of the corridor. And so, I'm just going to hand over to Erna now, who's going to talk about the female glossy identification project. Thanks so much for listening to me. Hi everybody, I'm Erna, as Lauren said. I'm part of a group of volunteers uh, who've become involved with the Glossies in the Mist project. Lauren fondly calls us the Glossy Gang, which we're quite happy to take as a name. I'm hoping that today what I can do is tell you about our part, the Glossy ID part of the project and inspire you to um, come along on the, on the journey and do something similar down in your area. Oh, excuse me. <clears throat> Haven't been doing enough talking today. So, oh, three reasons why I love Glossy Black Cockatoos. <coughs> First reason, if you're a birder, you know that when you go out to photograph birds, you get the camera on the bird, you get it zoomed in, you're in focus, you're about to push the button and the bird flies away. Glossy black cockatoos stay in the tree for hours. I've had photographers say, I was out for a walk, I saw some glossies, so I went home and got my camera and came back and took these photos for you. I mean, what's not to like as a bird, a bird that stays in the tree? Second reason to love glossy blacks, as Lauren said, they all have individual markings. The females can be recognised as individuals. You know, any other time you go birding, you see a golden whistler in a tree, you walk 500 metres, you see another one and you've got no idea if it's the same bird or a different bird. But with glossies, if you've taken a photo, you can really get a good sense of how many birds are around, uh, where they're moving, what they're doing. I, I just love them for that. It's great to be identify, able to identify individuals without putting uh, trackers on them or banding them or anything else. Third reason to love glossy black cockatoos, they're always smiling. Just look at that face. How could you not fall in love with a glossy black cockatoo? This is Babe. She was my gateway drug into the Glossies in the Mist project. Lauren and a colleague came to our bird club and told us about the project and asked us to submit sightings or photos of glossies that we'd seen. So I sent Lauren this photo of a bird I'd photographed only a short time before. And after a couple of days, she got back to me and said that this was a new bird that she hadn't been seen before uh, and that she was new to the project and would I like to give her a name. So I named her Babe, I got a little dopamine hit and I just thought, this is what I want to do. I want to go and find glossies. I want to see if I can find Babe somewhere else, see who else I can find out there. Uh, so yeah, this is Babe, she's my, my first glossy. Before we move on, I'll, I'll just point out to you this little notch in their lower jaw. 
that Lauren talked before about them eating the nuts. And as I go through the slides, I'll explain to you about this notch a little further. This is the distribution of glossy black cockatoos. And one of the things that I didn't understand about distribution maps initially was that this doesn't mean that everywhere you see those purple marks, you'll find glossies. It just means that sometimes, in some cases, they may have been seen there once, that's all. Uh, so really, although it looks like a big distribution, it's only going to be in patches throughout that area where you're going to see them. But you can see that you guys down on the south coast have got a nice patch down there, and I'm sure there are plenty of glossies down there for you to find. As Lauren said, we work in the Great Western Wildlife Corridor, which is this yellowy area on the map. It's essentially equates to the Windy Caribbee Shire Council area, although we do push the boundaries a little bit on that corridor. Uh, we volunteers have broken this corridor up. Uh, we have the north, the central and the southern corridor. I'm doing most of my glossy ID work in the central corridor with a couple of other women. But there's one, one volunteer, Kay, up in the north, who is working up there identifying primarily glossies who are on her own property. She's lucky enough to have glossies coming into a dam at her place. And she's doing a, a big study on um, who's coming in, who they come in with, when they come in, which trees they prefer in the area. And she's just getting an amazing amount of data up there and learning heaps of stuff for us. Down in the south, we have another volunteer who's doing a lot of glossy ID work in, um, oh, just right down in that southern area. In the centre, there's three of us working there doing glossy ID work, and we have a number of glossies that have been picked up <clears throat> in that area. Glossies have done themselves a disservice by being very picky eaters. Uh, unfortunately, they only like certain allocasuarinas. The, the one you can see in the image is the littoralis, which is the one that we've got most commonly in our area. Really, the, the essence of the whole overall project is retaining and restoring as much of this habitat as we possibly can. So we really, we're trying hard to track where, where these feed trees are and where the birds are eating them in them. We, we sometimes find feed trees and there's no evidence of eating, but in other areas, it's quite clear the birds have been there quite a lot of the time. And, it's really important for us to document that so that we can protect these feeding areas. On the right hand side of the image there, you'll see the nuts that they like. So they, they come into the tree, uh, usually in a group, and they will sit there for hours and hours just working their way through the tree. They pick off a single nut, uh, cone with their left claw, uh, the left foot, and they've put it up to the beak and rest it in that notch that I was talking about earlier on, scrape off all that hard outside and work their way down to the seed. Fortunately, the, uh, the good side of that is that they leave a lot of evidence on the ground after they've been chewing. I should also mention that if you get your ear in, you, you can hear them chewing. If you walk quietly through the bush, which is a little bit hard for my group, um, you will actually latch onto the sound of them chewing and you can go and find them. It's the sound of these chewings dropping to the ground. So this is a, a carpet that we would classify as low to medium in density. Sometimes once a group's been sitting in a tree for a few hours, you get a beautiful dense carpet of these, these chewings underneath. And it, this is a really important sighting. It's, it's really, more important to find chewings than it is to find birds. And I'll explain that as we go along. So in, on the right-hand side of that slide, you'll see up the top are fresh chewings. They're probably 24 hours old or less. In the middle, the orange ones are aging. So the birds have been in that tree or in that area in the last week or so. And then as time goes by, the, 
color of the chewings changes. If we've seen, or if anyone's seen chewings under trees, then as I said, that tells us that birds have been, in, been eating in that area. And so that's a really important site. We need to keep a record of that so that nothing can be done to harm that feeding area. So we have this uh, website available online and we ask people to record sightings of chewings or of glossies. And down there on the right hand corner, people can access the website and provide some information. Uh, so they will record chewings for us or if we're really lucky, they'll actually record a sighting of birds for us. <clears throat> uh, there's opportunity on that website to uh, upload a photo, but if people have got a number of photos, we'll get in contact with them and make arrangements for them to send the photos to us uh, so that we can do a little bit more analysis. That's when we all come into the picture. This is the Glossy Gang. This is exactly what we look like. Uh, we each work on identifying the glossies in our area and trying to establish whether the photo that we've got this time is a new glossy, as we call them, uh, or a, a new sighting of a previous bird. The first thing that we do is double check that it really is a glossy. Uh, although Lauren said that glossies are the only black cockatoos in our area with red tails, I think lots of people in the public just focus on the idea of the yellow colouring on their heads. Uh, so we do get reports of yellow-tailed black cockatoos uh, as well. I recently got called by someone who said, oh, quick, quick, there's some glossies near me feeding in an aloe casuarina. So I grabbed the camera and off I went. And when I got there, it was a beautiful group of yellow-tailed black cockatoos feeding in a hakia. So unfortunately, not every uh, sighting is a glossy, as much as I love yellow tails. So I explained to you before that uh, we've divided the corridor into three parts. Uh, and each of us in our sections has created what we call a lookbook, which is kind of um, a, a book of mug shots of the glossies that we've had reported or recorded to date. Um, this is the one for the central corridor where I work with a couple of good friends. Uh, each, each glossy has her own page in our lookbook. I should mention that we have a team lookbook, which has got lots of information on every page, but we've also got a stripped down version that's available online so that if anyone's taken a photo of a glossy black, they can access the lookbook for their area and just have a bit of a look through and see whether they think they've got a new girl or whether they've got a new sighting of a known bird. So this is Molly. As you can see, we've tried to identify important um, aspects of her coloration that will help us when we're wanting to compare her with another girl. Uh, we try and get, if we can, one's each side, a photo of each side of her face because uh, her individual colorings are also not symmetrical. So the left side can, can look quite different to the right side. Uh, and we like a, a full length tail shot as well. Uh, then we have a look at the new bird that we've got and decide whether we're going to classify her as uh, her, her density of coloration as low, mid or high coloration and we'll hone in on those um, mug shots in the lookbook in that segment to make our comparisons. As Lauren said, we've now, we're now up to 180 birds. So it's actually quite a lot to work through uh, to see if we can work out if, they're, if we've got a new girl or not. This is a, a nice display of an ideal collection of um, glossy photos. If we can, we love it if we can get really good clear shots of each side and a, a face on shot. But it's really hard and uh, flossies are really hard to photograph. They're frequently in toward the center of the tree and frequently, you know, it's primarily needles that you get and we're almost out with a microscope trying to see her markings. 
this is an example of how it is not easy. <clears throat> the um, Flossy that we've got in the middle here, which we call probably Penny, uh, is a photo that we had submitted. Uh, we had her, this was a historic photo, and subsequently someone took a, a photo of a bird out uh, in the wild and uh, sent it into us. And we thought, oh, you know, maybe this is the one we've got in the middle here, probably Penny. But as you'll see, she hasn't got quite as much colour around the back of her nape, even though she's got that quite distinctive eyebrow and the spot behind it. So we, we just really can't be sure if this is the same bird. And then uh, this photo down on the side, this was submitted by my Pilates teacher because I just can't help evangelising about glossies wherever I go. And Emma um, saw this bird and took a photo just with her iPhone, uh, which is fabulous. I was really pleased. Uh, but as you can see, it's not super clear and we just can't be sure it could well be Penny. She was seen in the same area, but we, we don't know for sure. Sometimes we can be really confident, other times we can't. Let's take that one back. This is one of our more embarrassing stories. This is Winifred. Winifred was first photographed in um, Mittagong, not that far away. Uh, and then some months later, we photo, or someone else photographed her quite a long way away down in Penrose. And because we, we haven't got these birds in a confined area, we, we don't know much about how far they travel. So we were really excited when Winifred turned up down in Penrose. And um, this, she was sort of famous for being the bird that had traveled the furthest distance. And we put Facebook posts out about her. We wrote her up in the newsletter. Winifred's flown 17 kilometers and isn't she special? And then when we gained a bit more expertise <laughs> and Linda, one of our girls at Glossy's uh, gang in the central corridor was starting to do some tail studies. We went back and had another look at these two photos and appreciated that Winifred has got the tail of a somewhat older female. Um, the bird that we've now had to call Frida, uh, who is not Winifred at all, has got much more of a juvenile's uh, tail. So we don't get it right all the time. If we work through our lookbooks and we uh, can't find a good match or even a, a close match, then we'll write back to the photographer and congratulate them and tell them that they found a flossy that we didn't know about before. And, you know, it's just fantastic when that happens. We really love it. We ask the photographer to give the bird a name and she enters into our database, uh, you know, until the next time we get a sighting. Uh, if it's a re-sighting of a flossy, we'll write back and tell the photographer that. We also write to the original photographer and let them know that their bird's been re-sighted in a new spot and what's been happening. Sometimes we've had birds re-sighted with a juvenile the next time, uh, that sort of stuff. I, th I think that this is a really valuable part of the project in that you can ask birders to log sightings of glossy black cockatoos uh, and, and they'll do it for a while. But if they're getting feedback and they want to know if it's a new bird or, you know, what's happened to their old bird, then they're much more likely to be retained. This is, this is what's kept me going. You know, has someone sighted my bird? Have I found an, a new bird? Um, how far have they flown? What have they been doing? So to my mind, this is an investment that um, volunteers can make. We can afford to spend the time to keep our photographers engaged and informed about what's going on. Uh, and I, I think that keeps the enthusiasm rolling. The project's been going for over three and a half years now. And I know that if it was simply a matter of me logging sightings, I probably would have given it away. But if we've all made attachments and we're all, you know, passing on information about birds. And I, I think it really works. I think it's a good thing to be able to adopt in a project like this. Uh, what I realised I should have mentioned earlier on is that after the glossy sightings get reported on our website, importantly, Ro uh, Lauren puts all of those recordings into Bionet so that those recordings are available for the New South Wales government. If they're looking at development projects or 
any sort of other interference in natural areas, there are records either of the birds themselves having been seen there or of them having been feeding in that area, which is you know, a really valid, important record. We don't just simply need photos of the birds. Photos of the chewings is good enough evidence. It's really helpful. So once we've got a new bird, she goes into our database. I don't expect you to make any sense at all of this slide. It's just an opportunity for me to say, we are gathering so much information. And like so many projects like this, as time goes by, the more we're appreciating that bits and pieces of information that we just picked up incidentally are now actually really important. For example, this tail project that I was talking about, Initially, we thought it was all about the coloration on the bird's face, but now we're beginning to see that the tails are also telling us quite a lot of story about the identification. Uh, for example, I hadn't mentioned yet, males, some males also have tiny spots of yellow coloration. So sometimes we get a bird that's with, a, with an obvious male, but it's only got a little bit of yellow coloration and we can't be sure whether it's even a female or a male. Uh, whereas we're learning now because of Linda's work to identify the story that the tail is telling us as well about the bird. Anyway, heaps of data and we're hoping we can find a student that can come along and do some work with this because we've got more stuff to do and we want to be out taking more photos. So the outcomes of our project. We've, we've achieved a high level of community engagement. There's so many of us in the Glossy Gang are so enthused about the project that we're talking to people all the time. We're talking to our Pilates teachers. We're talking to our hairdressers. We're talking to people in the street. And you know, nowadays in some parts of the corridor, if you're walking around with a pair of binoculars on, someone will come, will come up to you and say, are you looking for Glossy Blacks? Are you part of the Glossy Black Project? It's, it's just really been great for the community uh, and for Glossies. We've had records of over 180 Glossies in the area. Well, Flossies in the area, and Flossie means a female, and so that means there's twice as many because a female is always with a male. Many of them have been photographed in more than one location, but so far, we haven't had any that have really flown 17 kilometres. They're invariably photographed in more or less the same suburb or maybe just one little hamlet or suburb over. They don't seem to travel very far at all. We've had sightings of more than 30 juveniles in the three years of the project, which is excellent, given that there are uh, birds that like to breed in hollows. Uh, and they have to really fight for hollows. We're, we're thrilled to have 30, but we'd like more. We've got a lot better understanding of the way glossies move in the project area. We had Sunset. Sunset is a, a glossy who was uh, photographed a number of times in the Buxton area and was photographed by a friend of mine on her property only two days before the 2019-2020 fires went right through her property and took out all of the feed trees and um, we had no idea what had happened to Sunset but subsequently only a few days later she was photographed just one suburb over feeding in another tree. Like, the way that makes you feel is wonderful. We've had lots of records of sightings and evidence of feeding as Lauren told you which have all gone into BioNet and have provided a really useful database. We've been able to identify important feeding areas and specifically trees that the birds like so that the girls from our propagating teams have been able to go out, we can show them which are the best feed trees and they collect seed from those trees and they're propagating those trees for the um, plantings that uh, Lauren's organising. We've had a couple of occasions where Hazard reduction burns were going to be done in um, important feed tree areas and we've been able to explain to the fireys that you know, that's a really important area and please could they avoid doing a burn in that area, which they've done, they've taken on board. The fireys have been really supportive of this project. 
there's been other occasions when road widening was done in some country areas and bee trees were going to be taken out from the edges of the road and we were able to stop that progressing, which was fabulous. We've had contact with people in other LGAs and including you guys now, which is fantastic. And hopefully uh, we will continue to talk to other people in other areas so that the project can be widened for the sake of all the Glossies. They don't know that they just live in Windsor Caribbee. They don't know about borders. For me personally, it's been so much fun. I've learned heaps and uh, getting me out there into the bush looking for glossies and looking for chewings has resulted in me and you know, the, the girls that go out with me in learning so much more about the wider environment. So that now I'm really interested in gangues and I'm interested to hear Michael's next presentation about that in the hope that maybe we can do something along those lines too. That's only our little segment of the project. As Lauren said, there's quite a lot more to the project, but um, that's my bit of it. And I hope that you'll get the impression that it, it's great to involve volunteers and that if you are a volunteer, you know, there's so much you can do for these endangered birds and it's really worth it. So back to Lauren. Oh, one more, one more um, uh, slide. Thank you to the photographers. We've got lots of photographers. These are the ones whose photos I've used in this presentation. And this is just my excuse to show you this gorgeous shot this is a juvenile glossy. When they're young, they have these yellow spots ventrally, uh, which they lose over time. We suspect this one is probably a female, although we can't be sure. So thank you very much, everybody. And back to Lauren. Thanks so much, Thanks Anna. So much Anna. Just wanted to um, let you know that there's other places that you can look. So on our website, if you want further information, and I'd just like to thank all of our partners and dedicated volunteers just like Erna for expanding our project beyond the reaches of what I would be able to do on my own. Um, thanks so much for having us here today as well and I think we're going to go to questions. Uh, thanks very much. <laughs> that, that was lovely both of you and uh, Erna your enthusiasm is just fantastic. Uh, <coughs> I've got a couple of questions here. One is from NX. I'm not sure exactly who that is. Uh, do you want to answer, ask that question yourself? I, could, I haven't got much experience can, with this, Mike, so can, perhaps if you ask. <laughs> uh, the question is, on breeding, do we know if glossies breed each year, conditions allowing, or are unlikely to breed if they have a juvenile from a previous year with them? Ah, uh, yes. Thank you for the question. Lauren, jump in if I get this wrong. Mm -hmm. Glossies will only have one juvenile per year if that... As I said, they breed in hollows, but they won't fight for hollows. And unfortunately, anyone else who wants that hollow ahead of them will get it. Uh, so, you know, the sulfurs and just about any other hollow breeder will get, go in and pinch the hollow. Uh, so glossies will produce one juve in a year. It takes a long time before that juve will fledge. And sometimes they keep the juvenile with them for 12 months, in which case they won't have another one the following year. So in a perfect world, they might have one a year if it survives. But yeah, it's really the odds are much smaller than that over time. Okay, the next question. Libby, do you want to ask that question yourself? You can't hear me, Libby? Lauren, is it for Lauren? Uh, no, sorry, Libby asked the question. Do yes, you I, encourage, I, sorry, I was going to asking her, did she want to ask it herself? But the question is, do you encourage people to adopt their local glossy families and record them over time? If so, does this work in terms of getting good data over a long time period? I reckon you can answer that one, Anna. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We don't have to encourage them too, Mark. <laughs> they just, they love it. Once you've done it, once you've got your bird and seen where it is, you know, people go out in, Hey, almost <laughs> to find the bird again. Yeah, we've got some fabulous photographers who are really committed to it. Um, a lot of our photos are submitted where they're just uh, incidental findings when someone else was out birding, but we've got some 
committed photographers who will go out hunting glossies, um, which, which we just love, yeah. Yep. Okay, the next question is from Cheryl Hook. Is there a glossy project running in the mid-north coast? Aaron, all yours. <laughs> That's actually my mum. Hi, mum. <laughs> um, so it is. <laughs> there is definitely lots of glossies up there, but I don't know of a dedicated Saving Our Species project up there. We do um, have a community group up around Coffs Harbour that that um, log their sightings, um, but there is no dedicated project. So maybe, maybe it's an opening for you, mum. Maybe you need to <laughs> just start your own glossies project up there. I've given uh, Cheryl access to a microphone, so be only because it's your mother. Uh, <laughs> but she hasn't taken herself off mute, so she might be shy. Oh, she's asked her question, so that's all good. Okay, so the next one's from Lexi Meyer, which is a question I've always had, but I've always assumed what the, the answer. If you see three glossies eating together at the same tree, are they the same family? Yeah, they are. So... If you, that's one of the ways that we can um, tell breeding success as well. So all of that amazing data in that spreadsheet that you saw Erna showing before, um, it does um, have in whether they're a trio and that's how we can tell at the end of the breeding season um, how many flossies have got a juvenile with them. So that's usually the juvenile from this year or last year's juvenile if there has been a hard season. And it's actually really cute after the winter breeding season, if you see them just fresh out of the hollow, they're really bunky. They're really funny. They'll fall <laughs> out of the branches and they can't feed themselves properly because their mum and dad will still be feeding them um, like regurgitating seed for them. And so you'll actually see them, they'll be really cheeky. They'll go and pinch the um, she oak cones off their parents while they've, they've already picked them and they're feeding on them. It's very funny to watch and, it's also a good way of um, finding glossies out in the bush as well, because you'll hear the begging noise of the juvenile. Okay. I don't have any more questions in the list. There's, um, Sorry, there's, there's still there's a one... few questions in the okay. chat there. Sorry, there is another one's come up, another one from Lexi. Uh, these all seem to be the same size. Oh, I guess that's a comment. Got another one, Luke Brown. Can you tell me the difference between yellowtail chewings and glossy blacks? Oh, this one's the age old question. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, glossies do have that modified beak. So they're chewings, once you get your eye into them, they're a lot neater and a lot more um, uh, regular. And also the end of the chewing where they're holding it will be a circular disc. And like um, folks from Queensland call them orts, that section, that round disc at the at the base and so that's usually how we detect whether they're glossy chewings versus yellowtail chewings which are a bit more just ripped apart and um, observationally as well yellowtails won't just sit in the tree for a long amount of time they'll just come through and have a little bit of a go at them and then move on whereas glossies will stay in the tree and work through the whole tree and that's when you get that really big carpet of chewings underneath the tree as well I hope that answers your question Okay, one more from Craig Dunn. How do we submit photos of glossies from the South Coast? Oh, yep. Yeah. Anna, do you want to talk to it? <laughs> well, can anyone use our website? Or does it, should the South Coast... I, I guess on the South... Yeah, I'll yeah it depends it because, like, in our area, as Erna has sort of explained, we've done the glossies for um, our particular project area. But it sort of needs someone from the South Coast to set up their own Flossies project. And then you'll be able to match your Glossies from your area to your database. And so we are always really open to if anyone wants to start up their own project down in other areas to help them do that and to tell them about how we did it. Um, and we also have some protocols and stuff with naming conventions that just help you get through the first little, where are we going to store all the data sort of stuff. But, um, <laughs> But in terms of adding them to our project, it probably wouldn't work because those glossies probably don't come to our area. They're probably just hanging out in their own area. But um, yeah, you could also use iNaturalist. I just saw in the in the chat there to, to log your um, sightings. But um, yeah, if you want to get a Flossy ID project up, let us know. 
Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you can always get to my email through our website. There's um there's a few things in the chat which I, I if it's all right, Mike, I'll just read yeah. those out. Um, yeah. We've, we've, we've sort of reached the end of the time, but we've got a few more minutes um, before we get ready for the gang gang. So um, Eric, uh, red tails will sometimes have last year's chick and next year's chick with them. Interest, interesting to see that glossies don't double up. So. No, they don't. Yeah. yeah so um, and, oh, I should said, sorry, last year's chick and this year's chick. Um, yeah, so uh, there's differences there. Um, Libby, uh, Libby, you you can ask that question. Um, yes, in terms of the project, where to put things, um, you could put it on any photographs on iNaturalist um, as usual, as we do with all of uh, any kind of species. But what we could do is to set up a project on iNaturalist, which has the same fields that you have in in your project so it would match the data would match because i think that would be more valuable to everybody so it would be perfectly possible for us to do that and if people are interested that's something we could do that means you don't have to sc store the data but but it'll be there if any scientists want to want to compare different areas it also encourages people to to submit sightings of glossies and feed trees and then that can be protective in the future yeah there's there's an additional um it's a comment really uh but there's a, a question and the uh, person has said asset protection zone seems to depend on who does the assessment um and can have an impact on feed trees save one assessor educated me that aloe casuarina were fire retardant another assessor from the same area told landholder that aloe casuarina were extreme fire hazards and had to go um, so the question is uh, sort of like a comment, perhaps educate APZ or Asset Protection Zone assessors to help with the protection of habitat. Is that something, Lauren, that is part of your role? Yeah, for sure. So um, I definitely do that in my area and I've been working with both park rangers and also RFS to to go into areas and assess um, the thickets of Alicajarina and to also just give them some information about um, foraging birds in that area and so definitely getting involved like also people like Erna as well just being really engaged and they can also give that kind of information because it doesn't have to come from a threatened species officer like you can just go into those areas and find the records and find the birds and, and then also give that information to the fire authorities letting them know because most of the time they just don't know that there's birds foraging in that area or they haven't surveyed it so more data and more more knowledge is the key to protecting these ecosystems. Fantastic. And look, there's a couple of other comments, some very knowledgeable people in our participants thing. Um, uh, Deb has said, Carnaby's black cockatoos will also continue to support the previous years young until the new chick fledges insurance policy. Eric has commented, red tails do that too. Just find a food tree and visit it every day until the food's gone. Um, comments about using- the trees actually. <laughs> yeah, that can be pretty hard on them. Um, so um, Julie uh, has said uh, to hosts and panellists, we have started to encourage people to take photos of female glossy black cockatoos in the Eurobadala through the Eurobadala Natural History Society. And Danny um, uh, has said, I think cultural burn practitioners say that the aloe casuarina is uh, flammable in certain seasons, but not in others. I know they, you know, in a big enough fire, they go up with a whoosh. Um, so um, there, there's uh, different information and different times and different states, obviously, when it's dry and moist that affect that. Is there anything there, Lauren, that you could? Um, I, I won't talk to cultural burning, but in terms of the the birds themselves and, and alicajarina as their food source, um, alicajarinas are fire sensitive. so. In a, in a low intensity burn, they'll store their seed up in the canopy and then hopefully won't be too affected by the fire and then they'll drop their seed after fire and regenerate. Um, but in sort of a moderate to high intensity burn or after drought, when the trees are already drought stressed and they've dropped their seed, a lot of the adult plants will die and a lot of the juvenile plants will die in fire as well. And so then it takes up, well, about eight to 10 years for it to actually produce enough um, nuts for the glossies to feed on it and it's only the female plants that produce the nuts as well so there is that big lag time and that's why we really have to think about protecting alicajarina 
even though it's a very common species, but just because it has that fire um, sensitivity and in terms of protecting glossy black cockatoos, we need to make sure that large patches of it don't get burnt and don't get burnt regularly. So I think, um, you know, low intensity burns and the patchiness and mosaic burning of cultural burning is, is a good way to go. Um, but also just educating all of our fire practitioners about the significance of keeping it in the habitat. Um, Libby, you've got your hand up. I just noticed it. This is just um, one from me as a, a sort of project manager, if you like. Um, we did get the information about glossy blacks being on the threatened species list and we um, we put stuff up on the website and we made posters and we talked to people but I'd be really interested to know how you promoted this to your people in your area to get the engagement that you have because obviously the engagement is very impressive so how have you been managing the project like that? Well, luckily we had some amazing community champions in our area already who had started doing little projects on glossies. So there was like this grassroots groundswell around glossies that we were able to tap into to start with. And then also luckily we weren't in lockdown. So we were able to do a great road show through our whole corridor where we went to community halls and we asked um, glossy black cockatoo experts from all over Australia, it was very exciting to come and talk about glossies and share their enthusiasm for them. And I also um, invited a whole, a whole lot of the landholders in that area. So the council did a big mail out for us. And we also um, promoted our projects through their Winter Carry web and all of the different Facebook groups as well for the different community groups. And we just got a lot of people coming to those um, initial roadshow. And then we've also kept that contact through um, doing talks at schools, doing NADOC day talks, and also through our newsletter. So we've been able to keep that groundswell happening. Even through COVID, we've, we've done really well going online. So yeah, and through community um, channels like Erna, yeah. The buses, I uh, think the buses. buses. You talk so, about that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I know we're running out of time. That. So um, yeah, we partnered with Red Room Poetry and um, Gundangara Elders to do um, a in schools uh, poetry and first languages program, which um, engaged lots of young indigenous people in our area to learn um, language and do poetry through language. And so we did a really nice schools project with them talking about conservation and with the theme of glossies and conservation around glossies, but then also them learning language. And um, then the, um, a few of the poems were picked and they were put on the back of buses in the Winter Carby Shire. And it was really beautiful to see the kids on the back of the buses and then all of these beautiful conservation stories with Gunungara words on them as well. So that was a really good outreach project. Thank you very much. That's great, Lauren. That's really useful to know. Great. So I, th I think, Mike, we're up to you giving yeah. thanks. I think. <laughs> okay, I think we're wrapping up now. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Lauren and Erna. That was absolutely fantastic. I mean, people do love glossies, and I think that anyone who's been watching today will love them even more, as much as you do, I hope. Thanks very much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Fantastic work, everyone. Now, um, look, we've got about five minutes before the scheduled start of the Gang Gang uh, session, and and you know, we're all very conscious of the amount of time we spend online. So we, we're giving you a, a couple of minutes into mission uh, where if you need to go to the, the loo or have a drink of water or boil the kettle or do something, you can quickly do that. And we'll start at 3 p.m. Uh, precisely. Don't leave the meeting. Um, just stay in here if you are staying for the gang gang presentation and we may have um, some other people join us. A fantastic turnout, um, Libby. We've got... Um, you know, 50 plus people in the room, which just sort of um, highlights how concerned people are both about the bird and their willingness to learn more and try and do things to help them. Um, just while um, people are here and you can um, turn off if you don't want to see these screens, but just to remind people that it is the Sapphire Coast um, Science Festival and uh, look, Libby through the Atlas, Bonda and a range of other organisations are involved in the Sapphire Coast Regional Science Hub and Sustainability Education Network. 
and uh, Science Week, the Sapphire Coast Science Festival, Festival is uh, an initiative of those organisations supported by Inspiring Australia and New South Wales and the wonderful manager, Jackie Randalls, who's based at Sydney University. Um, you know, these groups are supported all over the state. We know that science is important and we know that a scientifically literate community is vital for the, for the um, conservation and protection of so many of our um, wonderful species. So um, this uh, effort that um, has been put on, uh, the Atlas and Libby's amazing uh, efforts, if you haven't been to some of them, um, they're all recorded and the, the videos are up there for you to view at your leisure if you want to. Um, there was a symposium with Bega Cheese about their sustainability programs on the Friday. The Atlas hosted the East Australian Hotspot um, Symposium. We had some wonderful scientists in there. It's a really valuable set of materials about what's happening on our coast with global warming and climate change and the impact that that's having on ecology. Uh, we had yesterday Kit Prendergast, who's the bee babette or babette, and uh, she's an ecologist who uh, studies native bees. That was really great. And we can't go past today without reminding people that yesterday we had the 10 year celebration of the Atlas of Life an amazing journey uh, that Libby and her team of volunteers have taken people on. The amount of data that collected and the interest locally that's been generated by Libby's work and the work of the Atlas team has been remarkable. And if you want to know more about iNaturalist, Thomas uh, Masaglio uh, gave a really comprehensive little rundown for a beginner using iNaturalist. You could watch that little video um, and Thomas is doing other presentations as well. So there's things that have happened. There's things that are, uh, are going to happen. Um, on Sunday, we've got uh, a local student, Minka Waratah, the captain of Bega High School, and her father um, are talking about Tarthra Wharf and some of the amazing uh, critters that uh, live on the pylons there. They're a little bit concerned about um, not that there's a heritage restoration project going on, but it involves, um, I think, demolishing the existing pylons and um, they would like to see some efforts made to works that are sensitive to wonderful creatures like that nudibranch um, that's in your screen now. And uh, there's other sessions on Thursday the 19th, um, sorry, Friday the 20th, Joe Lane from Sea Health Products used to work for national parks, but looking at kelp and its um, uh, applications for health. Thursday, the 19th of August, David Howard from Clean Energy uh, for Eternity talking about sustainability and uh, his battery system on his house. And uh, he's been operating that for 12 months and doesn't get electricity bills. He gets electricity credits and he's very happy with how that's working out. So, and there are still tomorrow, we've got the science of nest boxes, echidna CSI, and on Thursday, forest monitoring and improvement with the Atlas. So it's a pretty big program. We're having lots of fun. There were lots of things that had to be postponed, but if you want to be part of them, you can. So now I've got two minutes to get my cup of tea and do something. We'll reconvene uh, in a couple of minutes to hear from the Gang Gang people. <laughs> 